Tank Man. The world stopped for a man named Tank Man. Now, some of you guys don't know who Tank Man was. We don't know if Tank Man still is alive, and he's not a superhero by any stretch of the imaginations. But in 1989, on June 5th, one man stopped the entire world, and this is Tank Man. The context for Tank Man was uh, Tiananmen Square, where a bunch of college students demanding reform in China gathered together, and they filled the entire square uh, shoulder to shoulder with young men and women demanding change. Now, the Chinese army was known for its brutality, and the government called them in to clear the square by any means necessary. And tanks rolled seeking to destroy and crush the rebellion that was beginning in this city. Observers were hoping for a regime change, for democracy to, to begin to blossom in China. But now it looked like everything was going to be taken away from the people who are demanding change, including their lives. And one man stood up and refused to go away. And so the picture you see there, if you want to put it back up, is a man who says, I will not allow this violence to happen. And so he stands in front of a tank and is willing to lay his life down for the people who are in that square. And it takes incredible courage. Those tanks ended up stopping. And he climbed up on top of the tank and called for peace. And it's incredible to see what one person's courage can do, how the courageous voice, the courageous calling out, the courageous action uh, can change an entire person's narrative and their story. And so we're going to be looking at a man who's a lot like Tank Man in the Bible. His name is Bartimaeus. He's a man who stopped Jesus in his tracks. Have you ever wondered what it takes to stop Jesus from doing something? If Jesus wants to do something, he's going to do it. And yet Bartimaeus stopped him on his journey to the cross and called out to Jesus, and Jesus responded. So would you guys turn with me to Mark chapter 10? We're going to read, starting in verse 46, and we're going to just read this story, and we're just going to let the weight of it press in on us, because my desire for us as we look at this text is that we would see a picture of our own journey with Jesus and how Jesus wants us to be someone who will call out to him when we need something. So it says this in verse 46. It says, they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho, which is Jesus, as Jesus leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many warned him to keep quiet, but he was crying out all the more, Have mercy on me, son of David. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man and said to him, Have courage, get up, he's calling for you. He threw off his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Then Jesus answered him, What do you want me to do for you? Rabboni, the, man, the blind man said to him, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has saved you. Immediately he could see and began to follow Jesus on the road. This story is so inspiring because here's a man who has nothing, who's a beggar, who's an outsider, who has no status or power, has the ability to call the Son of God to his cause. And he cries out, to Jesus. And here we find incredible courage displayed. And it seems to me when you look at this story, you find him displaying courage in three critical ways that are helpful for us in our own walk with Jesus. You know, sometimes when we think about how to follow Jesus, we are left without knowing how to do it, how to really engage with Jesus. I think this story tonight will help us have some ways or some handles on engaging Jesus in very real ways and in ways that are near and dear to our heart, that aren't just religious ways of like saying the right things or having the right answers, but being people who engage with Jesus in a real way. And those three ways that this man does it is that he has the courage to call out, the courage to come to Jesus, and the courage to ask. So we're going to walk through each one of these really briefly tonight. The verse is that Bartimaeus has the courage to call out. And we see that in verse 47. Look there with me in the text. It says this about Bartimaeus. 
When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And we find Bartimaeus crying out to somebody he does not know and has no way of knowing if Jesus will hear him. But he begins to cry out anyway because he heard great things about Jesus, that Jesus had the power to heal people. Some of us have heard that about Jesus. We've heard other people's stories of people encountering Jesus and their lives being changed. But we haven't experienced it yet for ourselves. So we may have friends that have connected to Jesus in a very real way, or we've heard of other people who've had their prayers answered, but we haven't experienced it to that level yet. But we're intrigued by it. And that's what Bartimaeus was like. And yet, he had an opportunity that was going by right in front of him, and he had no way of getting Jesus' attention other than to call out his name. And the Greek here gives us an impression as to like how he does this. The word that the Greek uses to talk about how Bartimaeus begins to cry out is the word cry zane, which literally means to scream. So Bartimaeus begins to scream out Jesus' name. And he begins to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And this call is courageous because he doesn't know how Jesus is going to understand. Now, what we know about the story is that this title, Jesus, son of David, is a messianic title. So he's not just saying, Jesus, you're descended from David, but he's saying, Jesus, you're the hope of our nation. You're going to be the one who's going to set all things new. The people of Israel at this time believed that God was going to send someone, a Messiah, who would end injustice and provide healing. Now, here's the trick. This phrase, son of David, means that the coming king, the Messiah, would be somebody who is just like King David. He's going to set up, a, set up an earthly king, a kingdom. And, that, and for most people, that was like a good thing. They're like, yes, it's great. We'll have a, a good ruler, a Jewish ruler, one that will be from us and for us. But for blind people, they had a conflicted relationship with David. You know why? The reason why blind people were scared of David is because it was known that King David hated blind people. Bet you didn't know that. I didn't really know that until I did a little bit of work, but I found that David was someone who despised blind people. And the reason he hated blind people is because when he was setting up his kingdom, he decided that Jerusalem would be a great capital city. The only problem was that somebody already lived there, a group of people called the Jebusites, and they were a powerful, small kingdom. And when David and his men came to take Jerusalem for their own, the Jebusites taunted David and shamed him. And they said, our city is so strong and so strategically situated that you will never take it. And we're going to show you how difficult it is to take the city. We're going to put the blind and the lame on the city walls to taunt you. And as a result, David said, I never want to see another blind person again in my life. So here you have a blind person calling out to Jesus. And it seems to me that when we talk about Jesus, some of us are really open to talking about him because we've not had any hurt when it comes to the name of Jesus. He's a friendly figure to us. But for others of us, it's kind of scary coming to Jesus, isn't it? Sometimes it may feel intimidating to cry out to Jesus because of our past. Because if Jesus knows our story, then we don't know if he's going to like us. We may feel like outsiders who are uh, unworthy of being people that Jesus would bring into his group. And that's maybe how this man feels. He feels like he's an outsider. He's unwanted. And yet he still believes because he's heard Jesus take care of other people who have great need. And what he lacks in eyesight, he makes up for with insight. And he begins to cry out to Jesus. Now, the problem is that the crowd doesn't like it. They're like, be quiet. They begin to shout him down. He's shouting. They're shouting louder. It's pandemonium. And they tell him to be quiet. But he has courage, continues to cry out. And then Jesus stops in his tracks and says, call him. 
So Jesus hears the man and he hears his faith and he's willing to be interrupted, which is good news for you and me. If we're in a place where we feel like Jesus is too busy for us or he's got bigger things going on, Jesus has the time to stop on his way to the cross to spend time with a man who has nothing to give him, nothing to offer him, nothing to exchange. He just needs Jesus' attention. And Jesus is willing to do it. So Jesus says, come. And here we find the crowd making an about face. And instead of being people who say, hey, stop talking, they then now say, start saying this. Look with me in verse 49. It says, Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man and said to him, have courage, get up. He's calling for you. So they're like so fickle, right? They're like, be quiet. Oh, now Jesus wants to see him. Have courage. Come. He's calling for you. Get up. Come see him. And I look at that and I realize that there are so many people that keep us from Jesus sometimes, right? Sometimes Christians, followers of Jesus are the ones that keep us the furthest away from him. They don't make space for us. They're busy. They want to get the show going forward. They've got a plan and they don't have space for the marginalized. And yet Jesus in the middle of that is like, I see you and I want you to come close to me. Call him. And he makes the people who are shouting this man down to be the very ones who call him to the feet of Jesus. I when I read that, I'm pretty uh, convicted because there are many times that I'm too busy for the people around me who are the most needy. And yet, if I want to be like Jesus and if I want to follow him, I need to make space for people who are on the margins. So let me just say this tonight. If you're somebody who does not feel welcome in church most times, we want you to feel welcome here. Doesn't it matter if you're single or you're married, if you're dealing with mental illness or you're doing great, if you've got addiction, if you've got father wounds and mother wounds or just church wounds, we want you here. Doesn't matter if you're someone who's gay or struggling. It doesn't matter if you're straight or you're feeling depression or pain or you're having the best day of your life. Whatever stage of life you're going through, we want you to feel welcome here. Because that's what Jesus does. He doesn't ask people to figure it out before they come to him. He just says, I want you to come. And what we find here is we find this man having to hear the call of Jesus, that Jesus is calling him and having to make a decision. So the first thing we saw was that he actually had to say, I have the courage to call out. He has to take another step of courage, which is the courage to come to Jesus. Can you imagine being Bartimaeus? He's sitting there. He's been crying out. Everybody's been against him. He keeps crying out. And then he finally gets what he's been wanting. He gets time with Jesus. And he has to make a decision. What's he going to do about it? And the Bible tells us that he stands up and goes to Jesus. He gets up and runs. Now, I, um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think I realize how dependent I am on sight most days. Do you guys think about the fact that you can see most days? I mean, I'm, I'm mostly blind without my contact lenses, okay? So I'm reminded very graphically every day that it's hard to see sometimes, okay? But there was this one moment that I lost my sight for a whole day. And uh, I had gone home to see my family. I had taken a shower and I used some shampoo I'd never used before. I'm not sure if it was a shampoo or something else. But the next morning when I woke up, I couldn't see. Now my eyes, like my retinas and those things still worked, but my eyes were swollen shut. It was the weirdest thing that I'd ever experienced. Has anybody ever had this happen to them? A couple people? Okay, it is terrifying to wake up and you're like, I can't open my eyes. Where am I going? And I kind of stayed in bed for a while, just hoping it was a bad dream, but then it didn't, didn't like resolve. And I realized I still couldn't see. And I spent the most part of that day trying to feel my way around the house. And this man has lived his entire life being careful where he went, watching out for obstacles that he couldn't see. And yet when he hears Jesus' voice, the first thing he does is like, man, I want to go. I want to go to him. And he gets up and he goes to Jesus. And then Jesus does something that's really uh, interesting. Jesus asks him a question. Look at the verse with me. Mark 10, verse 51. Jesus says this. 
It says, then Jesus answered him, what do you want me to do for you? There's a third kind of courage this man has to take. A step he has to take is to actually ask Jesus for something. Now, I think when I read this, sometimes I think like, wow, you know, Jesus, that's a little like cruel. You know he's blind. <laughs> um, isn't it obvious what he needs? But Jesus treats this man with dignity. His entire life, he's been a beggar, but Jesus does not make him beg. And Jesus treats him like an equal and says, what do you want? What do you need? You know, Nashville's filled with people asking us for help. How often do we just treat them like they're invisible? We don't treat them with dignity. We see homeless people around us, and we just kind of move past. Or we look away at traffic. You've been there, right? You're like looking. You're like, I, I, if I don't make eye contact, I don't actually have to like talk to them or look at them. And all of us have been in places where we see those around us who have great need, but we don't engage with them. But Jesus doesn't make him beg. Instead, he asks him what he wants. And here we find something that's incredible, because what this man does is he says what he wants without condition or caveat. Look what he says. Verse 51 says, Rabboni, the blind man said to him, I want to see. Now, this phrase Rabboni is a special term. The NIV translates this as rabbi, but it has a deeper meaning because you would not call someone in common conversation or you wouldn't call your teacher rabboni. That was a term that you would only use when you were praying to God. So this is both a prayer and a request. He's recognizing that Jesus is not just a good teacher. He's recognizing that Jesus is God. And then he says, I want to see. And the reason I'm highlighting this is because when we pray, a lot of times we try to give God an out if he doesn't want to answer it. You guys ever do that? Like when you're praying for something you really want or for healing, I do this. I'll go, God, if it's in your will. I'll be like, God, cure this cancer. This friend of mine is like, Dying, And I don't mean to make this you know, a joke, but it's true. I'll be like, pray for healing right now, if you will it, right? Because we're scared that God is going to say, you know what, I just don't want to right now, or I can't. Or we're afraid that God's going to be um, embarrassed. But God can do whatever he wants. It's not our decision in the matter, and it's not up to us to make God look good. God is fully secure in who he is. He doesn't need us to hype him up or prop him up. He knows what he's doing. And if he's not uh, going to provide healing, it's because he has a better plan. And this man doesn't say, Jesus, could you make me see, but only if you have time and only if you have power and only if like, it's going to be cool. He just simply says, God, I just want to see. Sounds a lot like the way my kids talk to me. Like, my kids don't caveat things. They just go, Daddy, can I have candy? Over and over and over again. I say, no. They'll be like, Daddy, can I have candy? Can I watch TV? Like, they just ask boldly with confidence because they know my heart as a dad is ultimately for them. And even if I say no, it's because I know that there's good reason for it. And this man just says, I want to see, and Jesus heals him. And we see a stunning transformation happen where the man who is by the side of the road gets onto the road, leaves the status of being an outsider to being a disciple and follows after Jesus. And he follows him the rest of his days. I find that it's fascinating that the first thing he does is he decides to follow Jesus because his life has been changed so drastically. I don't know about you. If I got the chance to see for the first time, I'd be like, I want to go see my family, see what they actually look like. Okay. Then I'm going to go watch some movies and maybe go look at uh, some beautiful things. But the first thing that he does is he says, I just want to know Jesus and I want to follow him because my life has been radically wrecked by the goodness of the gospel. And so tonight, as we were talking about this idea of asking Jesus for what we want, I think it's important that we are honest about what we want and we ask for it with urgency. You know, uh, a couple years ago, 
by a couple, I mean a long time ago. I was, uh, I was given the opportunity to go uh, take a trip of a lifetime. And my family, uh, my entire family, my parents, uh, my mom and dad, my brother and my sister, and then some other, other of our friends, we went to the Amazon River. Now, I grew up in South America, but where I grew up, it was hot all the It wasn't hot. I mean, it was cold all the time. And people kept on thinking we lived in the jungle. So we said, we should at least sometime while we're living here, try to actually go to the jungle. So we went to the Amazon jungle and we uh, took a week of going out onto the river and having excursions. And one day our guide, Guatachi, said, you know what would be really cool if you guys wanted to do this? I mean, it's kind of like a little bit more risky, but if you guys are, are brave enough, it'd be really cool to teach you guys how to catch alligators in the Amazon. And I was like, oh yeah, because I always want to be like Steve Irwin. If you guys know this guy, the crocodile hunter. I was envisioning this. It's like, this sounds incredible. I think my mom was like, no, she was along with us, but somehow, Everybody signed off on it, and he came to pick us up at midnight to go crocodile hunting. Now, we were traveling all week in a boat like this. We took a boat like this that night. This is a picture of me and my brother. I'm the one with the wife beater. It's uh, <laughs> flashing a gang sign, apparently. <clears throat> but this is me, my brother, some of my friends. We're all there on the river. That's the Amazon. And this is the kind of boat we were in. So it's not like fancy and it's not big. But one thing I want to do want to point out is that it's made out of wood, which is important because later on it's going to come into the story. So we get out there on this river and we're out there. It's dark. There are no lights. There's no civilization. The town that we're in is the only town nearby with power everywhere else. Man, it's just like it could have been a thousand years ago. Okay out there on the river looking for crocodiles because we're idiots. So we're out there looking. And the way that you're supposed to catch a crocodile on the Amazon is kind of like spotlighting deer here in America. Apparently, you're supposed to like hit them with the spotlight and then grab them, which sounds horrifying, right? Uh, but we were trying to do that. And instead, it started raining. Um, now, if you ever get a chance to go to the Amazon, uh, one of the things you're going to find is that it rains there different than it rains here, because when it rains there, you can't breathe. It just comes down like you not believe. And it rained like that. And it filled our boat with water and it flooded everything, including our engine. And our engine stopped working. So just like any guy, the guy was like, OK, so stop working. I'm just going to crank it again. And he did. And instead of starting, it started on fire. We're talking a five foot pillar of fire on a wooden boat on the Amazon River, okay? I've never been more afraid in my life. Because if you get in the water, the piranhas are going to eat you. If you stay on the boat, you're going to get burnt to death. There aren't any good options here, right? And yet, eventually they got the fire done, and then things seem to even get worse, because now we're on the Amazon at 1.30 in the morning with no power floating down the river with every single soul that we love the most. Now, one thing that uh, I need to tell you guys about is that the Amazon at night is not a safe place, and there's a lot of reasons why. I mean, you know, like poison arrow frogs and like all kinds of stuff like that. But there's one thing that is uh, part of the story that we need to tell you is that when we were there, the Amazon was also a place where there was a lot of drug running and there were pirates on the river. And so we're sitting there kind of floating down the river, hoping that someone would save us. And our guide's saying, please be quiet. The last thing I need is 15 Americans shouting out for help <laughs> in English. And so we're sitting there scared out of our minds. And every once in a while, we hear this boat coming by in the distance, just like this small little outboard boat going by, going pop, 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 pop. And everything within us wanted just to cry out, to say, help us. And yet we were afraid to do it because we were told that we shouldn't. And eventually, as the night continued to go forward, and getting closer to 2, 2.30 in the morning, one of the ladies on our team, one of our friends, couldn't help herself anymore. And as the boat came by, pa, 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 she screeched as loud as she could, socorro, ayúdanos, which means help us. I'll never forget that boat turned around and on it were two 
indigenous men who couldn't speak English or Spanish, but they did have the mercy in their heart to bring us home. And I say that story because I think it has a lot to do with this story. You know, a lot of us, when we come to God, we treat God like he's someone untouchable or scary or, or unapproachable, and we caveat our requests over and over and over again because we're afraid that he won't come through. But the God that we serve is not a dead God or a God that we read about or a God who's distant. We serve a living Savior who wants to interact with us. And so we're going to take some time and have 120 seconds, which is the time where we just reflect on this. And here's what I want you guys to reflect on. I want you to reflect upon this question. The question is this. What do you need to ask Jesus for? What do you need to ask Jesus for? A lot of us, we have deep desires within us, hopes that we stifle, fears that we don't want to name, requests that we're afraid to bring to Jesus. But if we want to be courageous people, we have to cry out and believe what the crowd said to the man, which is, have courage, he's calling have courage, he's calling for you. And to respond by simply asking Jesus for what we want. So the question is, will we be silenced by the crowds? Will we stay on the side of the road in silence? Will we stay seated in our sin? Will we, instead of those things, stand and come to Jesus? Will we declare to Jesus what we need? so that he will answer yes. Let's pray. Jesus, I know in this room, there are people with real need and their biggest need is you. So whether that's, I need an answer to prayer right now, desperately, I need someone to be healthy, or I need to know that you're with me, or I need to know that you're going to answer this financial need, or this health need, or this relational need. I ask that you will meet us in it. So congregation, Kairos, what do you need to ask Jesus for tonight?